Morning, everybody. This is our last lumbar spine lecture. I don't know how many we've done. What, three or four of them, I think. And there's even, I mean, I could go on and on. Uh, but this is as far as we're going to get with this. It is Wednesday. It is week five. It's spring 2020. Here we go. We should just quickly talk. We kind of left off talking about range of motion, or we just came up to this. We're going to get, after the midterm, we're going to get way into the biomechanical planes of motion, intersagittal movements, translations, and things like that. But for now, and clinically speaking, there's really only these guys you have to worry about. Forward flexion or flexion is bending forward at the waist. Extension is bending backwards at the waist. Right and left lateral bending, that's kind of side bending. And then right and left rotation. Right, so it's pretty, I've been doing good with this highlighter. Let's get this back out again. Right, so those are the planes of motion. There's extension, bending backwards and forward. Side bending or lateral flexion. And then rotation is twisting. And there's separate ranges of motion for the thoracic and cervical spine. Basically, cervical spine is the same thing. Who cares about, we're talking about water. Remember, we're talking about proteoglycans and glycosaminoglycans and how uh, the cells of the nucleus propulsus in particular secrete. That's their main export product is proteoglycans. Therefore, the intervertebral disc or the nucleus propulsus is about 80% water. So, but why do we care about it? Why did I go through that big thing about water? Well, because if you lose water contact, if the cells of the disc die, and we already know the circulatory system, there is no circulatory system really of the disc. It's terrible. And as the cells die, the water content drops. And as the water content drops, cells die. Or as the water content, it makes the disc more brittle and, and prone to injury. Right? And so as the cells die, the concentration of GAGs and therefore proteoglycans and aggregates, uh, they all kind of uh, dry up. Uh, and yeah, and that can lead to pain, chronic pain. So I think we talked about that, but again, just in case we didn't, unlike the disc, the vertebral body is a very rich supply of blood and nerves, the basal vertebral arteries and nerve uh, supply the uh, the implates, the bony implates as well. We'll look at pain syndrome uh, based on those in a minute. But for now, remember this is how the nucleus gets fed. It has no direct blood supply. It has blood coming from the cortical bone here and the bony implates. There's those little marrow channels that the blood can, nutrients that are the blood fluids, the interstitial fluids push out, diffuse in. We said usually during uh, nighttime when you have a negative pressure, we talked about diurnal change. The outer annulus isn't too bad. It has its own blood and nerve supply. Um, but yeah, so life without gags. If you don't have gags, the water content of the disc significantly decreases, which makes the nucleus propulsus brittle, and annulus fibrosis brittle as well. And it's prone to injury, especially torsion injuries can start ripping up the disc. Annulus fibrosis also has gags, as we said. Especially the inner, remember, I didn't really talk about that, but the, I mean, really, if you look at the overhead view of a disc, there's the nucleus propulsus. There's the very outer part of the disc. But there's really two parts of the annulus fibrosis. This inner portion has a higher percentage of proteoglycan. Uh, so this is the inner nucleus propulsus. And then we have an outer, I'm sorry, the inner annulus fibrosis. We have an outer annulus fibrosis that is almost all type 1 collagen. Uh, this, the inner annulus is kind of more like the nucleus. In the disc, you can't really see where the, the nucleus propulsus, in reality, where the nucleus propulsus stops and the inner annulus begins. They're very, uh, very similar looking. Hmm, somebody rocking out in a car going by. I don't know if you heard that or not. So vicious cycle. So here's kind of the story. Here's the doom of the disc, the degeneration of the disc. It starts out, let's say you did some new exercise in the gym. You did put a barbell on your back and you did twisting. 
probably the worst thing you can do for your knees and your back. Twisting, we used to do those back in the day. Maybe that's why I have such a bad back. Uh, but twisting, let's say you ripped a piece of your uh, annulus fibrosis. Are you going to have pain right now? No, no way. The the pain, the sinovertebral nerves, as we'll look at in depth today, they're out here in the outer periphery of the disc, so it can't feel any pain normally. Um, but you've just increased the volume of the nucleus propulsus, right? Greatly increased the volume. Um, so what? Who cares about that? You've also decreased the hydrostatic pressure by increasing the volume. Increased volume equals decrease in hydrostatic pressure. Remember we talked about the weight of your body and the weight of gravity pushing down squishes the nucleus and it's corralled by the annulus so it, it, it becomes rock hard. But that rock hardness, that's a hydrostatic pressure. Hydrostatic pressure based on a research, quite a bit of research, uh, we know that decreased hydrostatic pressure makes the nucleus propulsus cells lazy and the annulus fibrosis cells lazy. Uh, it needs that high pressure to stimulate them to do their job, which is, amongst other things, to make proteoglycan. We'll look at some of the enzymes it makes, uh, too. It makes other stuff as well, these nucleus propulsus and annulus fibrosis cells. Uh, we'll look at those. Um, but yeah, so decreased proteoglycans further dehydrates the disc and therefore this tear if the disc starts to get black and degenerated the next time you go do a twisting or you bend over and twist at the same time or you bend over without using your knees and pick something up it's more brittle so now it rips even further well what's that going to do that's going to that's going to increase the volume even more so that's going to decrease the hydrostatic pressure even more so that just makes the disc lazier, and you get into this, this kind of vicious cycle. Here's the disc degenerates. It gets blacker and blacker looking on T2-weighted uh, MRI. So here's the point where you've kind of reached the end phase. And now you have a very degenerated nucleus propulsus, and it's ripped its way all the way through. You're going to treat, this is the number one problem that you're going to treat according to, uh, in chronic pain, I shouldn't say, your number one problem is probably a lot of simple musculoskeletal injuries to the back. They get better in four or six weeks. Now, these are problems that can take years to, to get better, as crazy as it sounds. Annular tear can continue to heal four to five years. It's a very, very slow process. Um, but yeah, so we have a full thickness tear. Can this one be a source of pain? Absolutely, because we said the nerves, sinovertebral nerves, nociceptors live in the back of the disc. So some people, if this gets inflamed, some people are severely, severely disabled because of this. It, some people can rip the disc like this, and for whatever reason, no inflammation occurs. If no inflammation occurs, no pain occurs. So really, really weird. Okay, uh, then the axial load, we talked about that before, but normally the body carries the weight, most of the weight on the vertebrae is right in the center of the nucleus propulsus, but biomechanical studies on cadavers have demonstrated uh, that it shifts. If you have a full thickness annular tear, it shifts axial load over the posterior annulus fibrosis. It also overloads the Z joints, right, the facet joints. Um, so... Yeah, we've looked at annular tear before. Here's a patient. This was old, back 2012. This was a long time ago. I've been consulting a long time. Since 2004, 5 is when I started getting more into it. But as of late, I mean, my consultation business is setting new records every year. Get busier and busier. Uh, anyway, this is a 28-year-old patient. Uh, young kid, like you guys are this age, some of you. Uh, beautiful. Here's what most of your discs look like. See a problem with the other discs? Yeah, they're black. So we can't see it. Sometimes you can get lucky and see it, but most of the time you can't see, uh, you can't see a tear within the disc that might be going on. Right? If you do a test called discography, we might see... Oh, why doesn't that color? Hmm. I thought red should show up there. Let's see, how about yellow? Does anything show up there? No, I wonder why that is. Well, that's really sad. Um, anyway, so 
yeah, so you might see a big fat annular tear inside of there, which you can't see if they order provocative discography, which you don't ever want to do unless the patient's ready for surgery. I'm digressing. Got a long way to go. I better stop digressing. Um, but anyway, so these discs are re- patient has chronic back pain. But this is called degenerative disc disease. It's not severe yet because the disc height is still okay. You start to get worried when the disc height starts to thin. Like my L5 and S1, I'm almost bone on bone here. I have such bad degenerative disc disease. But again, some people with severe degenerative disc disease, they don't have any problems. So that's the one thing about the spine. you got to get the history and understand the history, the neurological condition, the orthopedic condition, and then the imaging condition to make a suggestion at what the cause of the pain is and make evidence-based treatment recommendations. Uh, Priority glycogen is a more demonstrated 1966 through a well-designed study that injury to the disc or degeneration de- decreases its ability to regenerate it as well. So the disc can heal. There are some enzymes that can clean up things and, and try to heal things. Discs often get damaged for torsion, twisting injuries, or axial overload injuries. You fall straight on your butt. Uh, or you try to squat, do maybe quarter squats with way too much weight, not good for the disc. Oh, I do my, I do like my enzymes. So here we come to some enzymes. Uh, like articular cartilage in the rest of the body, the disc has proteolytic enzymes, which clean up messes. If you get death of tissue, that can't sit there. It has to be cleaned up. So we have a cleanup crew, and these are usually the MMPs matrix metalloproteases. In fact, there's three types of MMPs, MMP1, 2, and 3. I do want you to know, I will test you, I'm almost, I'll always test on this slide, uh, collagenase, gelatinase, and stromylase. Stromylase is, this guy is trouble right here. Let's take a look at these a little more. Collagenase, um, that, so if you had if you have an injury to the lamellae, uh, there's some maybe type 2 collagen in the area. Uh, this collagenase can clean up any type 2 or in the nucleus propulsus if it can get in there, and it does because the cells of the nucleus propulsus and annulus fibrosus manufacture collagenase. And it can cut big pieces of collagen, type 2 collagen, into little pieces. And then gelatinase comes in and cuts the little pieces up into smaller little fragments, uh, which can degenerate away or carried out into the blood, get rid of those things. That's how it cleans up tissue. Um, Stromylase, or pronounced strom, like poem, strom, illicin. I call it stromylase. That's how I learned it. Uh, and or stromylysin. Oh yeah, I forgot the sin. Uh, stromylysin. New slides. Stromylysin. Is that right? Strom. Like poem. Strom. It's like strobe light. Stromylysin. Stromylysin is. This guy is no joke. This is a major destructive enzyme. Uh, it's very aggressively cuts up prote- dead proteoglycans. And specifically, it cuts between the E1 and the G2 domain. I would never ask you that. That's really for you. a super hard question. Uh, so that's good if it cleans up. But what happens if you get a gene mutation? You overproduced stromylysin, strom, stromylysin. Uh, that's not good, right? Because it's going to start cutting up some of the good proteoglycans as well as some of the dead ones. It's not good to have too much stromalysin around. It also cuts all the other types of collagen, type 2, uh, type 9, type 7. I believe it type type 1 is also cleaved up by this one as well. I'm not sure why that's not in there. I might make a note of that. Change that slide, add type 1. Right? So normally the MMPs only remove the damaged component uh, after a cell's been damaged. As I said, that's good to clean it up. Uh, and MMPs are usually not very active unless you're maybe a rodeo cowboy or something and really beat up your spine. Um, so that's good. But as I said, 
uh, it's not good to have too many of them. There's even extra precaution. There's something called plasmin uh, that is around. So MMPs ha are actually secreted, kind of like pancreatic enzymes, in proenzyme form. So they're not activated. Uh, to activate them, they have to be turned on by a molecule called plasmin. And there's plenty of that floating around. And as if that's not as at enough as an extra precaution, there are MMP inhibitors floating around. Uh, so if too many of them do get turned on by chance, there are some uh, the tissue inhibitor inhibitors of metallo, uh, metalloproteases, call them the TIMPs. The TIMPs are also floating around to deactivate MMPs, uh, just like the body, like an inflammation process. The body tends to overdo things. And the same thing with cleaning up some damaged tissue. There's too many MMPs around. And so we have another system where the TIMPs, 1, 2, and 3, are around to turn those things off as well. So the MMPs are fairly well regulated. But if there's a perturbance, what's that mean? A perturbulation or perturbance. If there's a mess up between the activators and the inhibitors of MMPs, then pathological degeneration can occur according to some uh, yeah, kind of old research. I guess it didn't seem 2009 is not really in research years. It's not that bad. Uh, the, For example, a temp gene mutation uh, there's some documentation on those, and some researchers have discovered mutations in these genes, uh, which uh, which doesn't turn off MMPs when it's supposed to, right? These guys turn MMPs off after they've cleaned up a minor injury to the disc. Somebody's got to turn them off. Temps do that. And there's gene mutations where you don't make, or you make a defective temp, and you can't turn off the MMPs. Uh, even worse, there's been knockout mutations of uh, even worse, if the genes overproduce MMPs uh, in addition to knockout mutations of the MMP. So we already said that there are genes where MMPs are overproduced. And then if you have knockout mutations, and what's a knockout mutation? That means the temp isn't dysfunctional. It's just not produced, period. Um, so those of all are theories of the cause of degenerative disc disease. Really bad if that uh, stromalysin is around as well. All right, so that was that. We got it. Now we've talked about the wiring before, but let's make sure let's put it in stone and let's maybe dig a little deeper into the wiring. Two most important nerves of a motion segment, by far, sinovertebral nerve, also known as the recurrent meningeal nerve. One board books like sinovertebral nerve. The research likes sinovertebral nerve. One board book likes recurrent meningeal nerve, recurrent nerve of Lushka is another obscure AKA. I don't think you'll see that one on boards. Uh, but yeah, it's a mixed nerve. It carries the signal of pain. So it's a sensory nerve and it's got some proprioceptive function that we don't really know a whole heck of a lot about. Um, it's also got sympathetic fiber mixed in with it, right? So it's a very interesting nerve. Uh, the other important one is the medial branch of the dorsal ramus. We've talked about that a little, but we're going to really dig into that. All right, let's dive into these nerves more. Sinovertebral nerve, um, super strong, a.k.a. Kramer uses reoccurrent. Most of the research uses sinovertebral, though. Uh, it is considered a reoccurrent branch, or it is considered a branch off the ventral rami or anterior rami. So that's how you might see it. It is a branch. But what's weird about it, it goes, the ventral rami goes into the neuroforamen, and the recurrent meningeal, or the sinovertebral, goes in there as well. Uh, it also gives rise to a weird little plexus of nerves that we can look at. What does it innervate? This is a good slide. That's a lot of s stars for first quarter. When you get the fifth quarter, there's like, can be, zillions of stars on these slides. I got to get rid of these st the star system. It's gotten out of control by fifth quarter. But anyway, posterior and posterior lateral annulus at the same level. So it's a, what, what does that mean? Posterior and posterior lateral annulus at the same level. Yeah, so 
That makes sense. So the L4 sinovertebral nerve innervates the L4 intervertebral disc. Specifically, though, the posterior and posterior lateral portions, it doesn't innervate the lateral or anterior. Those are thought to be innervated by sympathetic afferents, which really don't carry pain very good at, in the spine. It also innervates the posterior and posterior lateral annulus of the level above. Yeah, the level above. There's some research that shows it might even innervate the level below or even two levels below. So those those nerves can reach. It's a research is cloudy. It's more on animal research, those things. But we definitely know it innervates the disc. It also ant, uh, innervates the anterior portion of the thecal sac or dural sac at the same level. We think those are more sympathetic branches there than pain branches, though. You won't find that in the board books, though. Uh, and the adjacent posterior longitudinal ligament is also innervated. Posterior longitudinal ligament is really stuck to that outer layer of the disc, so for all practical purposes, it's part of the disc in the lumbar spine. There's a cartoon. There's a sinovertebral nerve. Um, well, actually, that's the ventral root. It's a pretty small ventral root. It's just a cartoon, though. And you can see it gives off a sinovertebral nerve. Center vertebral nerve splits, innervates its own level disc, and it gives off a branch to the one above. And I said there's some research that shows it goes down below and innervates. It might even go way down here and innervate the disc below. Um, but again, that's all based on animal research. All right, so notice how the L4 sinovertebral vertebral nerve innervates one, uh, its own level and one level above. Yeah, and it can be below as well. We should also note that it has communication. Here's the gray ramus communicans coming down here, carrying postganglionic sympathetic fiber. It also has a branch going in here. Uh, so there are sympathetic fibers running through these nerves as well. All right, we looked at this before. I think we did that not too long ago. Um, but did I blow it up? Yeah, I blew it up. So here's kind of the start of the show. There's the nociceptors of the sinovertebral nerve. They plug into the PLL, which is right there. Plug into that, and they plug into the ventral portion of the thecal sac as well. Uh, they arise from here. That's the anterior ramus, right? And then they got some fibers are coming in here from the gray ramus communicans. Some of the fibers go this way. They'll teach you that in neuroscience. I'm not going to go too crazy, but I am going to talk about these things for sure. Um, there is the sensory root that's a member of the quad equina. Like, I mean, in reality, this one part of this could be sensory, part could be motor. Sometimes they're doubles. I can't see it there. Uh, but when they come out, they come together right here. This is the spinal nerve from here to here. That's it. That's that spinal nerve. Here's a motor root. Here's a sensory root. They come together. You've now entered the peripheral nervous system once these two combine. This is still sensory or the central nervous system until they combine. And we'll talk about a lot today. We're going to talk about this bigger one. That's the ventral ramus. And this is the posterior ramus. And this posterior ramus can split into two, sometimes three pieces. We'll look at that. That's coming. But that's a really important concept. Which way does the pain travel? Kind of messed up my picture, didn't I? I wonder if I can erase that. Let's see. Uh, erase all ink on slide. Oh, cool. Um, which way does the pain travel? Well, the pain travels, let's say you get a rip annular tear, gets inflamed, it starts sending nociceptive signals, it goes down the main body of the sinovertebral nerve. For your purposes, it dumps into the ventral ramus, and then it turns around and it goes back, stays in the sensory, sensory root, 
I do believe it has cell bodies like everybody else right here. Uh, then it goes into the spinal cord, goes up to the brain. There's some research, this is not going to be on boards, but there's some research that shows some of the fibers actually traveling backwards down the gray ramus communicantes into the sympath lumbar sympathetic ganglia, and they've traced it up to L2, where it goes back in. Let's pretend we're up higher at L2. goes back in L2 and then comes down like this. So that research was back in the 90s, and I don't think they ever followed up on it. Um, but there was some pretty compelling research that says, uh, because if you've been in practice a long time, L2 disc herniations sometimes can mimic L5 disc herniations or even L4 disc herniations. Always wondered why that was until the 90s when that came out uh, and kind of explained it. All right, so that's the, the pain pathway. So everything I just said here, I don't think we need to go back over that. You can read it if you want. Fibers reverse direction. Everything I just said a second ago. Not going to say it again. But there's the pathway I just wasn't able to draw until I started doing these YouTube lectures. It's nice to be able to draw. Although I don't know why this doesn't do good over that. It didn't do good over the disc, the MRI images, for whatever reason. As I said, the sinovatibral nerve is a mixed nerve. It has sympathetic fiber in it. Sympathetic fiber comes from the gray ramus communicans. Watch out for that word. Plural is gray rami communicantes, if you're talking about more than one of them. Um, could say its final part is made of somatic, uh, a somatic root from the ventral ramus and the autonomic root from the gray ramus communicantes. Yeah, because they mix together right here. Right Here's where the sympathetics come in. Uh, and this would be, they're going different way directions, but that's where sympathetics go out. Uh, so really we have a mixture right in here of sympathetics. And some sympathetics may actually come out this way as well. So sympathetics are definitely mixed in with a sinovertebral. Okay, everything I said already. Um, it, it also supplies the epidural venous plexus. is supplied by sympathetic fiber. So those have the ability to vasoconstrict because of that. Posterior plexus, okay, this is in Bogduke. I'm not sure, I don't think Kramer talked about it, but Bogduke's a board book, so should know about this posterior plexus. Sinovertebral nerve, uh, nerve gives rise to literally a nest of nerve fiber. Lives on top of the posterior longitudinal ligament. It's called the posterior plexus. Some theorize it's another potential source of low back pain. You say a disc herniation can't cause low back pain? Of course it can, right? It's, the, it's not the herniation that causes, it's the tear through the disc that causes the back pain. But here's another possible source. If the herniation pushes into the thecal sac and that's innervated, maybe that could be a source of pain, although we think it's sympathetic derived, so we're not, we're not, too sure sympathetic afferent fibers probably aren't so good at feeling pain. Let's take a look at the nest. This is the posterior plexus. Uh, we can see sinovertebral nerve right here. I mean, ventral ramus would be connected into the ventral ramus out here. Uh, but here it is, nevertheless. Uh, you can see how it's got many branches, much more complicated than they they draw it in the books. But you can see it goes up to both levels. Uh, it covers the posterior longitudinal ligament. It digs into the back of the disc. This is the posterior plexus, and there's just a nest of fiber. You do a discectomy, and the, di and the doc needs to go in and find the hole that gave birth to the herniation. He's going to plow through all this stuff, right? Some people, maybe no big deal, but some people, maybe they have a developed, quite well-developed posterior plexus, and that could uh, maybe not do good for the post the clinical outcomes may be decreased no research on that but it sure makes sense okay you might not know much about this the, this relatively new uh, the basal vertebral nerve and ver what's a ver vertebral genic pain and before i go on so where's a where do we do a disc tear yeah what it, so this is called a full thickness annular tear right 
let's say it doesn't herniate, and we said that it can, uh, the, the disc, the nucleus is usually degenerated, full of evil cytokines like tumor necrosis factor alpha. You could get a whip at, wicked inflammation here, and it can signal pain. Pain will go up to the brain, and the brain will go, oh my God, my back is killing me. What is this called? This is called discogenic pain. Disco, it's one word. Genic pain, right? So back pain has many causes. One, probably the most common, is a discogenic pain. What does that mean? That means that the disc is ripped and you have a symptomatic annular tear in your hands. Uh, so this is another type of pain. This is called, to where we go? This is called, I should have bolded this, vertebrogenic pain. Vertebrogenic pain, 516 bold. Okay, so that what does that mean? That means the pain is coming from, or at least it's believed based on research, not a ton of research, it's relatively new, uh, but the, the vertebral bodies themselves, specifically the bony vertebral implants, can become pain generators. So it's not the disc, it's not the facet, it's not the SI joint. It's actually the bone itself that's giving rise to the pain. Uh, who's the nerve that carries pain out of the bone? That's the basivatibular nerve. There's a basivatibular artery and vein. And the nerve is, nociceptors have been discovered in there. So, and that's, we know that already, right? A compression fracture can be really, really painful in some. Again, not all people. I actually have a pretty good compression fracture, and it hurt like hell for about six weeks. I don't have any back pain at that level where it fractured. Uh, so it's not always a source of chronic pain. Uh, but nevertheless, it can be a source of pain. Uh, they've done blocking studies. They've blocked the basovitibral nerve on people with chronic pain with modic change and really eaten up vertebral M plates. The surgeons tend to call it isolated disc reabsorption. Uh, but sure enough, nothing else has worked, and they do a basivertebral block, and all the pain stops. Uh, so here's the basivertebral nerve. Uh, it comes right in through the basivertebral foramen. I think that was actually in your lab. It's one of the, your lab, a hole in the back of the vertebral body. And you can see that it's the, the bony end plates are very well innervated with nerve fiber, unlike the disc, doesn't look like this. Uh, but if you get degeneration, if you get rat bite erosion here, uh, and big, deep Schmorl's nodes, some Schmorl's nodes are no big deal, uh, but the disc is black on MRI, full of tears, can be a chronic source of pain. Okay. Here is a, let's look at modic change. What is that? You'll get that as you get in the upper quarters. Uh, but here's a normal, healthy spine, 45-year-old male, T2-weighted. I could have cranked up the contrast a little, but pretty good-looking discs. They're not black. You have nice height between the discs, right? They look good. So four. This is a T2-weighted image. There's the cerebral spinal fluid. Everything looks great. Let's see another one of my clients. This guy had facet syndrome. Did nothing wrong with his discs. Oh, look at this guy. Back a couple of years ago. This is a 43-year-old male. Severe low back pain. Failed chiropractic. Failed injections. Failed everything. Uh, MRI was taken. So you upper quarter students, what type of modic change is this? First quarter, don't worry about it. But where's the modic change? Well, look at the vertebral bodies. See how there's... They're, homogeneous. They have the same gray color. How about over here? Oh, they got, this is the T2 weighted. See how it's all white like that? And look at how the, we call this rat bite erosion. Look how the vertebral implant is just chewed up like a rat was in here gnawing away at it. Um, the, and look at how the disc has collapsed. Look at how big the disc is here and here. And this disc has collapsed with, probably this disc is shredded. Can't see it on the MRI. Um, but this is called type 2 modic change um, because we're hyper intense. We're too white here. 
And when you go to two, the T1 weighted image where the thecal sac is black, fat shows up white. There's epidural fat here, um, but the thecal sac is black. And if it turns black, it's type 1. If it stays white, it's type 2. So this is a more chronic situation where some of the bone marrow has as type 1 modic changes and inflammation within the bone marrow in here. Uh, and that's been associated, there's been good research on that, that's associated with back pain uh, and, strangely enough, sciatica as well. Uh, type 2 modic change is the chronic phase where the inflammation is semi-burned out, uh, but you've destroyed the bone marrow in this region and the fibrous scar tissue has replaced the bone marrow. And that's what's thought to make this. And there's a type 3 and you'll learn that as you go up. But some spine surgeons call this condition isolated disc reabsorption. Okay, vertebrogenic pain. Um, yeah, so that's the body. That's the nociceptors being triggered, as I, we, I already talked about that. Uh, so relatively new line of research. Uh, there is a procedure that has been authorized, uh, approved by the FDA uh, a few years ago. So it's new stuff. Uh, and it's basically they burn out the basovertebral nerve. First, they do an injection to prove it's going to work. They numb the basovertebral nerve and see if it takes the patient's back pain away. If it does, then they go ahead and they ablate that, almost like a, a rhizotomy where they do the same thing with the medial branch. They can burn those nerves away. The trouble is the darn things grow back. Um, but yeah, that's the story with that. Here's the procedure where they go in uh, so they do have to uh, go in through the bone here, right? And there's no way, there's no other way in. You can't, that's the only way in is to go through. It's like putting in a pedicle screw. Uh, and then they have a little endoscope here, and they try to zap as much of the, the basovertebral nerve as possible. And that's called the intercept interosseous nerve ablation system. Uh, so basically everything I said right there. You're supposed to have modic 1 or 2 changes. The research that's been tested with this to get FDA approval is only on patients with the, the isolated disc reabsorption, but mainly they have modic 1 or made modic 2 changes. So I wouldn't still recommend this. It's still a little new for my liking. Uh, here's a cartoon of the procedure. So they can get a needle very carefully and inject the basovertebral foramen and see if that numbs the back pain. Um, and there's lots. I won't get into all my problems with the procedure, but you're only first quarter, right? Remember the mold, remember I love spaghetti? Uh, so I love spaghetti. I lo we're going to talk about uh, the I love spaghetti. So I stands for iliocostalis, and there's a lumborum thoracis and cervicis. Uh, we're in the, are we, looks like we're just still in the lumbar region, so iliocostalis lumborum this would be. Then I love, L would be longissimus. There's also, this is longissimus thoracis we're in here, but there's a longissimus lumborum as well down here. And then there's a spinalis for spaghetti. Uh, spinalis starts at L1, so there is no uh, spinalis lumborum. It's spinalis thoracis and spinalis cervicis, and that's it. That's a good board question, isn't it? No spinalis lumborum like the other ones. Together, mainly the the iliocostalis lumborum uh, and the longissimus lumborum, mainly they make up the erector spinae group, those big furls of muscle that you can see. And here's from Kramer. There's the how the breakdown, lumborum thoracis cervicis, iliocostalis, everything I said. But notice spinalis, there is no spinalis lumborum. Got it? All right, branches of spinal nerves. We're pretty good with this stuff. This might be a short lecture today. I shouldn't have said that. I think it goes on for a long time. I can't remember. Anyway, uh, remember the branches of the spinal nerve. So we have a motor and sensory uh, traversing nerve roots in the quina. They, they come out, they round the pedicle and go out the neural foramen or the intervertebral foramen. 
uh, when they come together somewhere in the foramen or maybe outside, depending, everybody's different. They form the spinal nerve. Spinal nerve is a mixed nerve. It contains sympathetic fiber, sensory fiber, and motor fiber. Spinal nerve quickly splits into a dorsal and ventral rami. I went over that kind of at the beginning of the lecture. The ventral rami, that makes up some major players. We'll actually look more specifically, but the sciatic nerve, the femoral nerve, uh, right? The obturator nerve, those are some big names, come from ventral rami. Dorsal rami goes up to your rectus spinae muscles. Uh, uh, but the dorsal rami also, and, and the medial, the dorsal rami splits in some branches. Uh, there's a medial branch, which we know already, intermediate branch and lateral branch. Intermediate branch isn't always there. Uh, here's my pet peeve with Kramer and Waxman. They keep using uh, the term, instead of dorsal rami or posterior rami, they say posterior primary division. I think that's not a great idea uh, because we're going to look at the some divisions down in the in the lumbar and sacral plexus has divisions, so that gets really confusing. Uh, because uh, so I don't recommend saying posterior primary division as an AKA for posterior rami. Uh, these these two terms should be gotten rid of in these books, in my opinion. And posterior, just the posterior rami is, should be used, right? And, of course, who am I to say anything? But I'm not the only one who says that. Standring and Gray's Anatomy, both. Standring's been around, it's the so it's 17th edition now. Uh, so who's to argue with that? So they use posterior and anterior rami. So that's what I would recommend for boards. All right, let's look at these players. So this is a side view of the motion segment. Here's an IVF right here, the L2, L3 IVF. Uh, there is the L2 spinal nerve. As we said, it's very short, doesn't live long. It splits into this anterior ramus here in green. All right, and then it splits into a posterior ramus, but look how short the yellow posterior ramus. I won't mark this all up. Uh, posterior ramus. Okay, that immediately divides uh, several different ways, but it almost always divides into at least a medial branch, which, so this transverse process is coming out of the plane of the page at us. Uh, the medial branch hugs the base of the transverse process, and then it splits into two articular branches. There's a superior articular branch. There's an inferior articular branch. So, oh, look at that. The medial branch actually supplies its own Z joint, right? There's the L2-3 Z joint, right? That's L2 and L3 um, made by the SAP, the L3 superior articular process. In the L2 inferior articular process make up the L2-3 Z joint here, but it also supplies the one below. The Z joints are double supplied, they're double innervated. I love asking questions about who innervates a, a specific facet joint or Z joint. And, or I like to say the L3 medial branch innervates which Z joints? Well, which ones does it innervate? Or let's say the L2, this is the L2 medial branch right here. Who does it innervate? innervates itself and the one below. What if I said, who innervates the, the L2, L3 Z joint? Well, it would be its own level through the inferior articular, but it also has one coming down from above. So it's innervated by, by L1 as well. So L2 and L1. See how that works? I got more slides. I'm getting kind of jumping my slides here, but Meet the posterior branches of the posterior ramus. Everything I just said already it arises from a splitting of the spinal nerve, very short-lived. That's only got uh, two or three pieces. It splits into the medial, intermediate, and lateral branch. We've already said that. Uh, and here they are again. We just talked about that. Okay. There's also, might as well say, the medial branch not only supplies its own Z joint and the Z joint below, but it also goes on to supply the multifidi muscle. Uh, we have multifidi muscle right above a chunk of that. It's segmental. Um, 
so this piece may continue and plug into the motor branch. Maybe this goes in and plugs in as well. Uh, but yeah, so it doesn't supply up here. This is supplied by uh, the one above. So the multifidae muscle is segmentally innervated. If you do a medial branch and knock this nerve out, uh, it's going to knock out the pain from L2-3 and L3-4, but you're also going to lose a little tiny piece of your multifidae muscle. Medial branch is clinically important, yeah, because they innervate the Z-joint. We talked about that, right? Look at them. They're sticking right into the Z-joint. Uh, so they're supplying, they're giving pain. You injure, you rip the fibrocartilage in a Z joint, or you pinch the capsule because your ligamentum flavum is not, it's getting degenerated and stuff. You have really bad back pain. Where's the pain coming from? It goes zoop, goes right down here. It goes in like that. Okay, it also gives segmental innervation to the multifidi, as I just showed you. Medial branch has divisions. I like this slide. What are the divisions of the L3 medial branch? Uh, so it supplies sensation to the, oh, we'll say, well, let's use L2. L2 medial branch. What does it do? It supplies, it innervates its own Z joints, so the L2, 3, and it, inter it innervates the one below L3-4, right? Via the descending articular branch. Ascending articular branch innervates uh, its own joint. Make sure you understand that stuff. It's also motor to the multifidi. Almost guarantee you this slide's gonna be on, gonna be tested many times before you get your license. Notice the ascending and descending articular branches showed you this stuff already. But again, note the medial branch supplies its own Z joint as well as the Z joint below. If you're talking about the nerve, it's its same level and below. If you're talking about the facet joint, it's at same level and it gets supplied by the one above. So it's a little, we got to make sure you know the difference between those. That's always a little confusion for students. Okay, just another picture. I'm gonna, we have to go through it again. There's the L1 spinal nerve. Splits into an anterior ramus, posterior ramus. Posterior ramus splits into several pieces. Here's the medial branch. Where's the only one we're looking at? I don't know what, I'm, what that one's supposed to be. Probably shouldn't be, be there. Uh, but anyway, it, the key of this is the L1 supplies. This is the L1, L2, Z joint here. So it supplies its own Z joint by the superior articular branch. The inferior articular branch supplies the Z joint below L2 slash 3. That's the whole point of that. So make sure you know that stuff. What about the lateral branch? There was a lateral branch. Um, that supplies normally the iliocostalis lumborum or thoracis or cervices, depending on which level you are. Not in all people, but sometimes it's weird because it, it can supply the skin over the greater trochanter. See, people are strange. Everybody has different wiring. And this is a chunk of people, say probably 10%. Uh, but the upper three branches give rise to a sensory branch, which goes all the way over the iliac crest and over the greater trochanter region. So it can be a source of pain for that. All right, just looking at those, we already went through those. How about an intermediate branch? So sometimes we have an intermediate branch uh, that comes off here. Not always, sometimes it, it usually comes off, actually I thought it usually comes off the medial branch. Um, let's better get to my slides. Uh, when present, it helps motor innervation, we already know. Uh, it helps with longissimus thoracis. It's also segmented. Don't I have another one on that? Yeah, but it comes off. Uh, it doesn't usually come off the posterior rami. It usually comes off either the lateral branch or the medial branch of the posterior rami. In this case, it's coming off the lateral branch, and that's the intermediate branch, and it uh, helps innervate longissimus thoracis. All right. How many slides have we done? 83... 
that's like 20 that's like what it's like 50 we better go a little further i really want to finish this today so this is going to overlap a little with your gross anatomy uh, which is fine this is still my territory i'm not going to follow these nerves all the way out into the extremities but when they come out of the spine that's my territory so lumbar plexus is mine uh, so it's formed here's a weird thing the lumbar plexus and you've already had this you studied in gross anatomy already and you've seen it actually coming out of the psoas major uh, and it is formed within the substance of the psoas muscle okay so it lives anterior to the transverse processes uh, and it's formed by all of the anterior rami of l1 l2 and l3 and most of the anterior rami of l4 l4 does have a couple other branches uh, as well as a branch from t12 all anterior rami, no posterior rami, no divisions. Uh, so it's all purely lumbar plexus is a pure, purely formed from the anterior rami of L1, really from T12 to L4, right? Source, I'm not just saying this stuff, right? Source is stand ring, that's the big Gray's anatomy, and Drake, that's the student Gray's anatomy. Right, here's an anterior view here lumbar plexus lives within the substance of the psoas you can see it's kind of the psoas is drawn in here and you can see how it's lumbar plexus is right here and it lives in there not true for the sacral plexus is no longer in the psoas um, but yeah it's inside there you should know these players you've had to learn these already for gross one anatomy so for me you need to know them as well we have the uh, the iliohypogastric we can see here the subcostal they didn't draw in, but that is considered, that gives a branch uh, from up above. We can see that on the cadavers. But iliohypogastric, ilioinguinal, genital femoral has two divisions, a genital division and a femoral division. Then the big femoral nerve itself and then the obturator nerve, that should be. Well, there are two. It splits into two divisions. I took those slides. I'm not going to follow this too far. Uh, Lumbar plexus division, so anterior rami, let's get more specific, of L2, L3, and part of L4. Uh, uh, also splits again into after, so after the anterior rami uh, are born, it's the anterior rami are going to split again. And this is where the divisions come in, why I don't like those other uh, ways of describing. Because how you can, you're going to have an anterior division of the anterior division? It's not good. Um, so the anterior rami split into an anterior and posterior division. Sometimes they're called branches, Stand Ring says. Uh, sometimes they're called branches. And the L1 anterior rami does not split into any division. It just comes out straight. Uh, note according to Stand Ring, the divisional structure is quite anomalous in the lumbar and lumbar sacral plexus. If those of you who have cadavers at your school, uh, it, you know, I, I was already, always amazed by the di not a single, we used to have like 15 cadavers. Uh, and I don't think, they weren't all face up, but the ones that we had the brachial plexus dissected, I don't think one of them one or two of those were alike. They were all anomalous in some ways, um, especially uh, some some of the divisions, the the divisions were kind of crazy on some of them. But they all had different, you know, very few of them had that beautiful M that you could see to get yourself orientated. Uh, there I go on my rant about the word division again. Um, but yeah, so here it is. This is the lumbar plexus. Uh, so we have the subcostal nerve. Um, the full nerve is not involved, but it does give a shoot or branch here. Uh, into L1. So therefore it does contribute to the to the lumbar plexus. But here are the main players. Uh, L1, you can see it splits into the iliohypogastric and ilioinguinal. Uh, you can see the genital femoral nerve coming off here. Um, now w once we get to L2, we start getting some divisions. We have a posterior division in yellow here and an anterior division uh, in green will be right here. Okay. Uh, these are considered branches by some authors down here. Uh, so lateral femoral cutaneous nerve, that's clinically important. 
right? Get a hit pointer uh, right where your ASIS is, and you can entrap the lateral femoral cutaneous nerve and get horrible debilitating pain on the, post, on the anterior lateral thigh. Moralgia parasthetica, right? You guys learned that yet? There's a condition about that. Got to be careful because it can fake an L2 or even an L1 disc herniation can present just like that. So you have to know how to clinically differentiate those two. Okay, uh, femoral nerve. You can see it's made by posterior divisions. All right. So make sure you know those players. It's just kind of a big picture, right? So lumbo, uh, lumbar plexus and the uh, the sacral plexus, they form the sciatic nerve, sacral plexus mainly, but you can see what a gigantic nerve that is. Uh, so you're going to treat hundreds of patients with sciatica. Specific key nerves of the lumbar plexus, everything I just said. So anterior divisions are from L2, L3, and L4. They form the obturator. The main posterior divisions, L2, 3, 4, form the femoral nerve. So the femoral nerve and the obturator a nerve are like brothers, right? They come from the same nerve, just different, split in, splits into different divisions. Small branches from the posterior division, so this one splits again, of L2 and L3 make up the lateral femoral cutaneous nerve. Let's look at the lumbosacral trunk. I usually, that's the only thing you online people are missing. Um, I do usually pull out that the cadaver pelvis, and I do show you the sciatic nerve, lumbosacral trunk, uh, the S1, S1, S2, S3, ventral rami, the piriformis behind. You're not used to seeing the piriformis from inside the pelvis. You're used to seeing it from the outside. Um, but lumbosacral trunk, it's born about where the ala of the sacrum is usually, and it's born where the L4 and L5 ventral rami fuse together into one big nerve. And that is the lumbosacral trunk. That goes down and connects into the uh, sacral plexus and makes up a good chunk of the sciatic nerve. That courses uh, through the greater sciatic foramen, and we'll look at that in a second. But it's made up from the following components, all of the L5 anterior ramus, part of the L4 anterior ramus. Remember, L4 is actually part of the lumbo, uh, lumbar plexus as well. So they kind of communicate there. Sciatic plexus, it's located in the posterior wall of the pelvic cavity on top of the piriformis. Uh, it is, may, our two main nerves arise from this. This is our sciatic nerve. Pudendal nerve is through Alcox Canal, is quite busy as well. Um, I just had a, a client over the weekend who had a uh, radiculopathy of the or neuropathy of the pudendal nerve. I think it turned out to be from an injury, and that supplies kind of the penis and the perineal region. That can be very disabling, just like sciatica. It doesn't happen. It's very rare to happen. Sciatic nerve. I mean, you're going to have tons of patients with that problem. Uh, who forms it? I always remember four by four L4 through S4 forms the sacral plexus. So. All of the lumbosacral trunk uh, uh, is formed, uh, who forms the sacral plexus? All of the lumbosacral trunk, so L4 and L5, all of the anterior rami of S1, 2, and 3, and part of the anterior rami of S4. Okay, so 4 through 4, that's who forms the sacral plexus. Almost the same as the sciatic nerve is almost pure, uh, pure sacral plexus except for sciatic nerve has no S4. That's the only, according to the Gray's books, anyway, which are all board books. So, Okay, here is the sacral plexus, just showing you uh, what the deal is. So it's important. This is the sciatic nerve is born right here. Uh, we can actually see the formation of that uh, nerve. But the sciatic nerve has two divisions. It's wrapped with a sheath but it has a common femoral, a common peroneal part, it's an AKA, uh, that's formed from the dorsal division. The tibial part is formed from the ventral. I always remember TV. Tibial nerve is formed from the ventral uh, divisions of the ventral rami. Okay, that's why 
I won't go talk about that again, but that's why division is important. So these are all anterior rami, right? All of these guys, anterior rami. doesn't show posterior rami. They split into a, a dorsal or posterior rami and a ventral or anterior rami. Got it. So ventral rami give rise to the tibial part. Dorsal rami give rise to the common fibular part or common, that's strong AKA is common peroneal. I mean, they've been trying to get common fibular in for about 30 years. So it's still around. Uh, with the exception of S4, each sacral anterior rami split into an anterior and posterior division. We said that already, uh, except S4 only has an anterior division. These divisions go on uh, go on uh, to combine with similar divisions and form terminal nerves. How do you study all this stuff? you got to draw this out on your window with your dry marker, or if you have a whiteboard, great. you got to practice drawing this stuff out. That's the only way I could do it. Draw it here first and then see it on the cadavers. When I saw it on the cadavers, it just sinks and sticks in your mind. And then teach it uh, to a, your imaginary friend. Teach it to your roommate. Teach it to your student. you got to teach. Uh, that's where you really ingrain this stuff. Teaching it is hard. Um, but that's a great way to learn anatomy is to teach it to other people. All right, went through that. Uh, the sciatic nerve will go a little further because, I mean, this is more getting into anatomy and clinical stuff, but uh, you're going to treat hundreds of patients, you MD, future MDs and chiros and physical therapists and acupuncturists. You're going to treat hundreds of people with this condition, so you need to understand it. I'm just going to scratch the surface here. Uh, shameless plug for my website, chirogeek.com. You want to, I got tons of information on sciatica and the sciatic nerve. I go way deep into this stuff. Uh, but here's a nice picture. I mean, you get pain burning down your leg. could burn, be burning down the front, the back. It depends what nerve root is hit, but there's basically how the, the nerve looks. And there's a cartoon uh, of a kind of a foraminal disc herniation compressing and inflaming one of the exiting roots. And if it's L5 or L4, it's going to be part of the sciatic nerve. Right? It is the largest nerve in the body. And you guys who've seen it in gross anatomy, it is really, it's like a pool, like the middle of a pool stick. It's not the fat part of a pool stick or the skinny part of the pool stick, like right in the middle. But it's, can't think of anything, like a baton. I guess we don't use batons anymore. Uh, but it's uh, it's thick. And uh, it is formed by all of the sacral plexus except S4, right? So you got to know that. Uh, it includes the lumbosacral trunk is part of the sciatic nerve. That could be a common question. Uh, it's inflamed. Uh, commonly inflamed via uh, L3, 4, or 5 disc herniation. Uh, probably the most common L4 herniation is the most common type of disc herniation. It usually compresses the L5, traversing L5 nerve root. It's definitely a member of the, of the uh, family here. Here's a client. Where are we at? Here's S1. It's got a little rudimentary disc, doesn't he? A little transitional segment here. L5. L4. And we see anything weird? L3. Well, there's the thecal sac here. T2 weighted image. Oh, some of you saw it. It's got a big fat disc extrusion here. Right? Three types of disc herniations protrusion, extrusion, and sequestration. There's a couple ways to differentiate them. Usually, the rule of thumb if you draw a line on the vertebral end plate, if it goes below, or above, it's an extrusion. If you see daylight here and there's a fragment loose, then it's a sequestration. Okay, I'm digressing. I don't know how I have so much energy today. Um, sciatic nerve, we already know. It's formed by the posterior division of 4 or 5, i.e. the lumbosacral trunk, as well as S1 and S2. Common peroneal nerve comes off of those, and the anterior division of L4, 5, S1, S2, and S3, which makes up the tibial component, tibial nerve component of it. Leaves the pelvis through the greater sciatic foramen. You definitely, for boards, need to know the things that come in and out of the greater and lesser sciatic. 
What's another th- uh, sciatic foramen? What's another thing that comes through the greater sciatic for greater sciatic foramen? Which is what's the greater greater sciatic foramen made by? Easy anatomy question, right? Greater sciatic notch. Two ligaments. Sacrotuberous ligament, sacrospinous ligament. Great, that makes the greater sciatic foramen. Piriformis muscle, right? How about that nerve, that other big, it's not as big as a sciatic nerve, but it's pretty darn big. The big is a pencil shaft, if not bigger sometimes. Call it the little sciatic nerve sometimes. Posterior femoral cutaneous nerve also comes out of there. Right? Gluteal nerves come out of there. All right, that's anatomy property. All right, uh, and it's wrapped in a nerve sheath. Nerve sheath does not go all the way down to the knee, though, usually. The nerve sheath contains common fibular nerve, and that's from the dorsal division. There's TV. The tibial nerve is from the ventral division. All right, there's something you see in anatomy. That's uh, pretty high, but usually the sheath, it comes out of its sheath and they split as it gets closer to the popliteal or the back of the knee, the popliteal fossa. Uh, very r- rare to split up higher than that. It's got a little extra extra protection for where you sit. Um, but yeah, it splits into the common peroneal and tibial nerves down here. Um, let's see. That's going to look to me like the tibial nerve right there common fibular nerve. Why? Anytime you hear common, what does that mean? It means it's going to split to anterior and posterior tibial nerves or superficial or deep tibial nerves. What does it do? The innervation? It innervates muscles. All, In fact, the entire posterior compartment of the thigh, all the hamstrings, it innervates. Adductor magnus, it innervates a piece of that. Obturator nerve inner, uh, innervates the middle or or medial component of the compartment of the thigh. Uh, and then all of the sensation uh, and all the muscles, too, of the leg and foot, right? So basically the back of the thigh and everything else below the knee is innervated by uh, the sciatic nerve. Well, it's got many divisions of nerve root in there, right? Uh, and then sensory, it carries sensory information from the uh, skin of the foot and lateral uh, lateral leg. Why doesn't it say medial leg? That's L4, yeah. It should say just the foot in general. I'm going to fix that. That's 560. Fix. Not lateral. Okay. Uh, and then you can you can figure out. That's your job as a clinician when you do a neurological exam. When you do an exam on someone's sciatica, you got to figure out where is it coming from. Is it an L4 disc herniation? Is it an L5 disc herniation? Is it an L3 disc herniation? One way you can do that is to test the muscles and the nerves that each root level plug into. Uh, some example, uh, these are very scientifically figured out dermatomes where they actually did selective nerve root blocks and numbed people. They went in the IVF of L5 and they injected lidocaine and numbed the L5 nerve root. And they said, where does it feel? Where do you feel the paresthesia on your leg? Where's the numbness on your leg? And they had uh, people draw draw with markers where they felt the most numbness. Uh, so this is L5. This is from my website. Um, I didn't put L4 or L3 in here, but L5. Uh, most people, about 75%, feel it on the dorsum of their foot uh, and the kind of the inside of the big toe here. 20, 50% felt it in a little wider, including red and yellow. 25% felt it in kind of weird places. But you can see the, the difference there. Uh, felt, and that's classic. Five is the outside of the calf, top of the foot, uh, and... But even in 25% of people, or even more or less, um, 25% of people actually felt it. 50% of people felt it uh, medially. Or no, that's laterally. That's right. That's okay. So that so they didn't feel it on the side, which is good. Four to the floor, I'm thinking. L4 always goes on the medial part of the calf. But here's S1, the same deal. So 
Uh, those are dermatones. You've already started learning those, I think. Hey, we did, we did it. Okay, great. So that is the end of the lumbar spine. We'll start the thoracic spine or some neural, basic neural anatomy. I'm not sure which one we're going to do next. Uh, and this is all the material for your midterm. Is that right? Is your midterm next week or the week after? I can't remember. I think it's the week after, actually. I think embryology is next week. All right, we'll see you in the next lecture.